Hey gamers, welcome to my game room. AJ from Rolling With The Rock here. It's Wednesday, October 14th, and my birthday, and we are continuing the countdown to number one of my top 67 board games of all time, with numbers 40 through 36. Just a couple quick reminders. Remember, during the month of October, I am doing new board game content every Monday through Saturday here on the YouTube channel. And then Sunday nights over at twitch.tv slash rollingwithrock, I am streaming live board game content. Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, we are doing what we're doing today. Top 67 board games of all time. Tuesdays, I give you a rock review. On Thursdays, I give a rock reacts unboxing video. And on Saturday mornings, my son Remy joins me and we look at some kids games. Also want to remind you for my top 67 games of all time, these are games that I have played. While it looks like I have a lot of games, there's so many more games out there that I have never played or even seen before, though I do know a little bit about them, I can't rate those games. So there's plenty of games that are gonna be in the top of the BGG lists that just won't make this list because I've never played them before. If you think there are games missing, please go ahead and let me know about them in the comments below. I always appreciate trying to have new games to look at. But for right now, let me know what you think of numbers 40 through 36 in the comments. And it does get you entered into board game trick or treat for Halloween night this October 31st. With all that out of the way, let's get right back into the list with number 40. At number 40, we have the auction bidding tile laying game from Lookout Spiel and Mayfair Games, Isle of Sky from Chieftain to King. In Isle of Sky, you take the helm of one of five clans and you are given a screen with that clan's name on it. You're also given a starting tile with your castle on it. And then what we will do at the beginning of the turn is every player on the game will draw three tiles out of the bag put them in front of their screen. You then take an ax that you were given and put it behind your screen, corresponding to one of the three tiles. You will also take coins and put them, assigning those to the other two tiles in increments that you wish. And what this does is that after everybody has assigned their axes and their coins, you pull your screens away. You automatically discard any of the tiles that had an ax, and then starting with the start player, you go around and purchasing tiles from the other players. If you purchase a tile from the other player, you pay them the amount of coins that they put behind their tile. But if those players have tiles left over at the end of the round of bidding, then they have to pay the amount of coins that they put behind the tile. So you can't just set the prices super high because if nobody buys it, then you've spent all of your coins. So there's a lot of push and pull there. Then after the bidding phase, you go to the tile placement and that's very much like Carcassonne. We are trying to connect roads and achieve different victory conditions on the tiles. It is a, it, it, like I said, it, it has a Carcassonne feel to it. It does things a little bit differently. I really like the auction phase of this game and that's something that Carcassonne doesn't have, so that's one of the reasons why this is higher on the list than Carcassonne is. But this reminds me of Carcassonne. It adds a couple more mechanics that I like. It adds different types of scoring. There's like 16 different scoring tiles, so different objectives. Uh, similar, I, I don't know if uh, cartographers took, you know, you know, took inspiration from this, but cartographers has the you know four seasons with the four different scoring zones. Uh, Idle Sky has that same thing. They have an A, B, C, D scoring zone, and you score similarly to how Cartographers does it. So they might have taken inspiration from this game, or, you know, that's just a common mechanic. Maybe many games do that. But I do like Idle Sky for its auction bidding, for its tile lane, and overall, it it says it's a 60 minute game. That sounds about right. It's not overly long. It doesn't overstay its welcome. So in at number 40, that is Isle of Sky. Number 39. Number 39 is a family friendly game set in the alternate 1920 plus world of Scythe. And that is of course, My Little Scythe from Stonemaier Games. 
And in My Little Scythe, you take control of a faction that is all based on the animal companions of Scythe. Uh, I did recently do a review of this game on my channel. I will link that above. If you would like to find out a deeper dive into My Little Scythe, you can check out that video. I would be really glad if you would. Um, but My Little Scythe takes a lot of inspirations from Scythe, but it does do some things differently. There is a pick up and deliver aspect of Scythe, uh, My Little Scythe that's not really present in Scythe. And there's a couple other, you know, they, they definitely make things more friendly to kids. But as I say in my full review, this is still a fun game for adults to play. Now, if I'm just playing in a group of adults and somebody wants to play a Scythe game, I'm almost always going to probably pick Scythe back here. But if there's any children around or when my children start to get older, this is going to be a great game to have because it has adorable art. It's, like I said, it is family friendly, but at the same time, it is a still a scythe game. And to be able to pull that off is quite the feat. So if you like scythe, but you're wishing you could play it with, you know, younger children, not super young like how my son is right now, but, you know, oh, this says, I think it says like 8 or 10, uh, 8 plus. So yeah, you know, they're late single digit ages. You could definitely play My Little Scythe and both, you know, kids and adults can enjoy that. So once again, at number 39, that is My Little Scythe from Stonemeyer Games. Number 38. Back at number 60, I mentioned Dominion and how it set the groundwork for all deck builders after that and that there would be deck builders farther down on this list. So here at number 38, we have a deck builder, Legendary, a Marvel deck building game. This one is specifically Villains. So there are two base games for Legendary, um, Actually, I think that might be a couple more now, but Legendary Villains for Marvel. Uh, this is not the Encounters series. Legendary and Legendary Encounters, I, from my understanding, are slightly different. I'm not really into sci-fi, which is most of what the Encounter stuff are. It's like Aliens and X-Files and a couple other things. I've never played any of those. I don't really have any interest in those themes, but I love Marvel, so... This legendary is the one for me, specifically the villains. So I always uh, enjoy rooting for the bad guy. In, I, I think it, when the bad guy has a good story, when the bad guy has a good story, they are almost more relatable than the goody-goody heroes in stories. That's why a lot of times when I watch professional wrestling, I root for the heel, which is the bad guy. Because usually the bad guy is telling a better story than the good guy. And that's the case, at least in my opinion, with Legendary Villains. The Legendary Villains box tells a better story than the original Legendary box. It also, unlike the Legendary box that comes with a board, in my opinion, Legendary Villains does it better because it comes with a wonderful playmat right there. So that's your nice legendary villains playmat. And then I have a ton of content um, for legendary. This is just one box of it, but you can see all the cards in there and then the playmat goes right in the middle, which is really nice. But we have a lot of content for legendary. We have both the legendary uh, main box and this. We have fallen behind over the last year or so on content for this game, but I really don't need to add any more. We have so much. There comes to a point with deck builders or LCGs or collectible card games where you have enough content to play the game for as long as you want. And that's the case right now here with Legendary for me. I don't really need 
to add any more content. They, I'm sure they'll come out with sets where I'll be like, oh, I really like those characters. I want to add that to my game. But overall, what I have is plenty good. Um, this is a fun deck builder that has any Marvel character you can imagine. I, I like the villain sets, but you can you can mix and match. You can do whatever you would like to do. You can play heroes on the villain mat. Um, it's, it is a choose your own adventure kind of how you want to play. And some of the most fun I have playing this game, which sounds silly, is actually just creating a scenario for it. Now, there are apps or there's uh, things that allow you to just pick five random heroes and, or villains in this case. And that's fine too, but I kind of like to craft a story or emulate a story from the comics or the movies and, you know, choose my villains or choose my heroes for specific reasons. Not necessarily that they play well with each other, but for to be able to tell a story while I play the game. And that's one of the things that I really enjoy about uh, Marvel Legendary is that I can play a game that I really enjoy because the game itself is solid, but then I can craft a story that I don't think any of my other deck builders really allow me to do. Uh, even deck builders that might be higher on this list than this one. But in at number 38, nice play mat and all, is Legendary, a Marvel deck building game, Villains Edition. Number 37. Number 37 is a journey adventure game from Orion Lockett and Red Raven Games, Near and Far. Now, Near and Far is a sequel game to another Red Raven game, Above and Below, which is also on the shelf behind me. Uh, we like both games, but Near and Far is a better version as would be expected, it came after uh, Red Raven and Ryan Lockett would make improvements on the system, change a couple things, make things, you know, more enjoyable for the players. The really cool thing about Near and Far is the books that you have in here. The first book is, like, just pages and pages of stories and scenarios. So the game will tell you, read Q9, and you will read Q9 aloud, and then if it has different options on it, you will choose one of those different options, and you won't know what the other ones end up leading the road to, but these, it's almost like a choose-your-own-adventure book. Then, the other book in the box is the map selection book. So you can play on different maps so there's one and then you can flip to a couple pages later and you have a different one like that and these all have different locations on them different stories to go with them you get treasures you can collect different sets of tokens and you fight bandits trying to you know complete that journey and there is actually a campaign where you can play all the way from the first map all the way to the end and we were actually in the middle of that campaign uh, prior to everything going on in the current situation with the pandemic so we have not been able to finish the campaign yet the even the player boards are really beautiful you have these tents and you put them down on the map as kind of like a route it allows you to rest and be you know work from those spots instead of always from the starting spot. You have the town that you start in each round. Uh, this is actually a double-sided board, but these give you, these are like your worker placement phase where you can place uh, your character in one of these to take the action. And it has, um, you know, it doesn't all, you, you can buy these really, really nice metal coins for it. The art is, uh, with all of Ryan Lockett's games, absolutely gorgeous. Overall, it is just a very fun, uh, story-driven game. And a big part of the enjoyment of the game is finding out all the different stories, elements, and 
everything that this game has to offer. Um, it is, like I said, it's higher than near and uh, above and below. I'm pretty sure this is my highest Red Raven game. I do want to play the expansion Amber Mines because I understand that it has a cooperative campaign in it. And that would be a lot of fun too because right now our campaign is uh, competitive. I would love to do a cooperative campaign in the Amber Mines when we finally get an opportunity to play this game that many times again. Uh, we haven't get, fit, been able to finish this campaign, so I don't know if that's going to have any issues or not. We're also really excited for Sleeping Gods, which is an upcoming Red Raven game that has been on recently on Kickstarter and was funded. Uh, that will be delivering at some point here in the near future. And it is another game in the above and below and near and far genre of story driven games from Red Raven. And that excites us greatly. It excites me a lot. Like we liked above and below. We really like near and far. At this point, I expect to love Sleeping Gods. So when I do this list next year, I still think Sleeping God, uh, above and below, uh, <laughs> excuse me. I still think that Near and Far will make my top 67 games. But as long as between now and then we get Sleeping Gods played, I would fully expect that to as well. So those are just, you know, I'm, I'm specifically talking about Near and Far right now for Red Raven. But I just gave you three really, really solid Red Raven games to take a look at. Above and Below, Near and Far, and then coming in soon, Sleeping Gods, and... Earlier on this list, we did mention the ancient world. So if you like the art styles in this game, from Ryan Lockett is one of my favorite artists in all of board games. I love that for Red Raven games, Ryan puts in so much work individually for this, for the graphic design, for the art, for the game mechanisms. Uh, it's really, really inspiring. And so I really recommend that if these games sound like anything that would be up your alley, uh, go ahead and take a look at Near and Far, my number 37 from Red Raven Games. Number 36. So we have talked about deck builders on this list, but this is the first dice crafting game that I even know about, let alone on this list, in at number 36 is Dice Forge. And Dice Forge has a really cool concept. You're given two dice that have starting faces on them. As you play the game, you remove faces from your dice and add improved ones on there. So you're rolling dice, getting resources from them to remove those faces and then add new ones. So just like in a deck building game where you start out with starting cards and then eventually call those cards out once you've replaced them with better ones if you choose to do so. In this game, you are calling out your starting die faces to replace them with better ones to earn glory points. You are a hero chosen by the gods uh, trying to do heroic acts to earn those glory points and the player at the end of the game, uh, either nine or 10 rounds based on player count, is the one with the most glory points. So the, the whole concept of dice crafting is very unique to, the, to Dice Forge. Uh, again, I, there may be other games out there that have used it, but not in my collection, not that I know of. Uh, the, only other, the only other time I've seen dice like this is actually in some Lego board games where they have crafted Lego dice, but they don't really change the die faces during the game. It's just the way that Lego builds the dice for their games. Um, but one of the things that I love about Dice Forge is actually the uh, way the components are stored in the box. So I took off the in a uh, rule book and that is the top of 
the box there. This here keeps all of the die faces safe and secure. Inside the sleeve is a, another sleeve that has all of the die faces inset in it. So if I shake it, you can kind of hear the faces of the dice. And this shows you what all of the die faces are and where they go. Oops. <laughs> then, right on top of that, the cardboard unfolds. That sits perfectly in the side. So that has a perfect place for it. And then everything has a place in the insert. You have your pawns, you have the inset boards, where a lot of games make you put tokens on top of them. They actually put holes in the boards. Let me show you this a little closer. They put holes in the boards so that when you put the cubes in there, then you, if you knocked it, you wouldn't lose your place as easily, say, as on some other games where you you don't have those inset boards right away. Uh, even the card art is, uh, I enjoy it. You know, it has a it has kind of that mythical fantasy vibe to it, but in a slightly cartoony way. And then the most important thing, of course, are the dice. These are your dies. This is just one of them with the different starting faces. And you get one of each color. Uh, they're, they're very hard for me to tell the difference. Uh, I don't know if you guys will be able to or not with that. But one is slightly darker than the other. And these are like your light and your dark dice or your day and your night. And you use those to complete your basically goals and challenges to earn glory points, which are victory points at the end of the game. There is an expansion to this game. I do not have the expansion at this time. I would like to get it down the road, but this is just has such a, it has such a cool concept. I love when games come with an insert already and not just something thrown in there to, you know, kind of keep pieces in one spot. This has, everything in this game has a place in this insert. And that is so rare in board gaming that it makes such an impression with me. And so in at number 36 is Dice Forge. Now I'm gonna go ahead and hit you with that quick recap, number 40 through 36. Number 40 was Isle of Sky from Chieftain to King. Number 39 was My Little Scythe. Number 38 was Legendary, a Marvel deck building game, Villains. Number 37 was Near and Far. And number 36, Dice Forge. Go ahead and let me know your thoughts on these games in the comments down below. Remember, if you're subscribed to this channel and leave a comment on any video labeled Rocktober, it counts as an entry into Board Game Trick or Treat. Uh, thank you very much for joining me and spending a small part of my birthday with me. I greatly appreciate it. Go ahead and go back and watch the other videos from this Top 67 list if you haven't already. Tomorrow, Rocktober 15th, Thursday, I will be putting up a Rock Reacts unboxing video of Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle Charms and Potions expansion from The Op. And then on Friday, we'll be right back here with more Top 67 board games of all time. That will be numbers 35 through 31. Thank you guys so much for watching this content, for liking and subscribing and sharing my content, interacting with me here on YouTube and on Twitch. I greatly appreciate all of this support. It means the world to me. I hope you guys have a great rest of your Wednesday. This was AJ from Rolling with Rock and Rocktober. <laughs>